Hello, everyone. Welcome to Patients and Clinical Trials Digital Week, brought to you by the organizers of the Global Clinical Trials Event and Content Series. My name is Brandy Fiddler, and I'll be your host for today's session titled, Prepare to Engage, Listening to Patients for Greater Participation in Clinical Trials. First, I'll cover some quick housekeeping items. If you experience difficulties with audio or advancing slides, refresh your screen with F5. If you are experiencing other issues, hit the question mark button to receive assistance. At any time during the presentation, you can submit your questions into the Q&A window on the left-hand side of your screen. In 24 hours, you'll receive a link to watch the recording of this session. You can also download a few featured articles in the resource list box on the right side of your screen. Let's now begin by introducing our speaker for the session, Wes Michael. Thank you for joining us today, Michael. Oh, sorry, Wes. Now sure. I'll hand it over to you to begin the presentation. All right. Thanks, Brandy. Hey, uh, this is Wes. I'm coming to you live today from the beautiful Marriott Crystal Gateway in Arlington, Virginia. And uh, let's get started. A little about me and Rare Patient Voice. I've been in health care talking with patients for over 25 years. I founded Rare Patient Voice 10 years ago to help market researchers find rare patients. Now we have over 130,000 patients covering over 1,500 diseases, and among others, the US, Canada, and the big five in Europe. We recruit many of them in person at patient events. Today, I'm actually at a sickle cell disease conference near Washington, DC. non-rare diseases as well. You know, clients wanted us to, to help with their clinical trials, so we do that also. Even though that is different from market research, for us it's similar. We have thousands of patients who signed up because they're interested in research, and we contact them to see if they're interested in clinical trials. So we get a good response rate. They know us, and they want to take part in research. And the combination of market research and clinical trials is a good one for this webinar, we're discussing market research we did with patients to get their opinions about clinical trials. Thanks to my rare disease friend, Richie Kahn of Canary Advisors for these points. If you're involved in clinical trials, especially for rare diseases, these won't surprise you. It's very difficult for clinical trials to meet their projected timeline. 85% fail, and why? usually due to challenges recruiting the patients. And why is it difficult to recruit the patients? Is, is it their attitudes and concerns about clinical trials? That's why we did the study, to find out why. We went out to our patient and caregiver panel. The response was overwhelming. Even though we didn't pay them for this study, we had to cut it off at about 2,000 respondents. Otherwise, I'd still be reading the open-ended responses. We asked what they liked and didn't like about clinical trials. Some had participated, but most hadn't. So it was good to get their perceptions. Remember, consider perceptions as reality if you're in the business of motivating patient action. And they told us what would make trials more appealing. Most of the respondents were patients themselves, 90%. 10% were caregivers, that either parents of children with diseases or spouses or adult children of parents with diseases. A preview of the results. The, these are four areas that you'll see stood out to patients and caregivers. The risks versus benefits of clinical trials, the desire for compensation, the location of the trial, and the need for communication before, during, and after the trial. Now let's get to the details. The researchers among you will love this. A perfect bell-shaped curve, albeit on its side here. How concerned are patients about the potential risks of participating in a clinical trial? They're split. About one-third are not concerned much, one-third third very concerned, and one-third right in the middle. 
from the point of view of wanting patients to participate, this is concerning. You could say that two thirds have some concern. And when people have any concern about something, they aren't likely to do it. There will be barriers to overcome to get them on board, especially as we are all looking for diversity in trial populations. We can't afford to lose potential patients due to these concerns, especially if we can overcome them. Before we get into the details of the data, here's a word cloud to take a broad view of their concerns. What words stand out? Side effects, unknowns, risks. There's a lot of things on people's mind. And they told us, they told us in infinite detail. Here's some of the, 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 the quotes. We collected thousands of open-end responses. Here are just a few that represent patient concerns. Um, fear of the unknown. By nature, clinical trials are testing untested treatments, so the potential risks are unknown. Another, another said, I'm putting my child at risk for a plethora of different wretched things that could happen to him. There's rariness of potential side effects. One said, I can't risk those side effects. I'm a single mother. And, and, and think about that when she's coming from the point of view of who she is, where she is, a single mother. It's about the patients. It's about where they are in their lives and what they're trying to do. They may suffer from a condition and don't want to make it worse. One said, I already have serious health problems for my diseases, and I have them relatively managed and don't want to risk that. So lots, lots of concerns we're seeing. Um, make, you know, and, but if, when we talk about these risks, of course we need to be honest with patients about the risks. Make sure your materials address these concerns. Don't sweep them under the rug. What would make clinical trials more appealing? Look at the top two, reimbursement and payment. Over two thirds chose those a convenient site or a trial done from home. That's the next one. Receiving results and information. And having a point of contact. What does this remind you of? I'll tell you what it reminds me of. What do you look for when you're looking for a job? You're looking at your payment and your comp compensation. You're looking at a location. Is it convenient drive from home or can I work from home? Or do I have to move for this job? Will my job have an impact? Can you communicate this to me? How am I doing? How is the company doing? I want information. And can I have a point of contact to help, a buddy or a mentor? So when you design a trial, think about it like offering the patients a job. Make it appealing. Here's more detail about the payment. On the left, the question was, about payment for participation on the right, about reimbursement for meals and travel. So two different forms of payment. Two thirds say payment and reimbursement would be extremely appealing. I know there may be different thoughts about this, but coming from the market research world, we pay people for their time. Who doesn't want to be paid for their time? And in the market research world, it is not seen to bias their opinions. Companies invest so much in the R&D of developing new drugs and a lot in the clinical trials, can't we budget to pay the patients? How much will that save if it means completing the trial on time? And notice, virtually no one says it will make their participation less appealing. Here's a truism, who turns down money? Have you ever wondered if you should tip someone? And then you do. And what do they say? Thank you. How much? I can't say. We didn't go into the, the, the amount. We pay patients for market research $120 per hour of their time. Their time is valuable, and paying anything shows that you honor that. Here's what they told us. Uh, I would like faster payment instead of waiting more than a month. Time is very important for a lot of people. A nice reward would be great during this economic inflation period. Access to latest treatments and access to treatment without incurring prescription costs. Favorable compensation for time, travel, and participation, not just a gift card with minimal compensation. Full payment 
and coverage for travel is ideal. Sometimes they cover stuff, but it's not enough for everything. But yet we take on the expense to participate. So it's the full range of areas where, where patients would welcome compensation and reimbursement. What about the location? Everything I learn, I like to think, is I come from reading the advice columns in the newspaper. One thing that keeps appearing in those columns is about destination weddings. Many people don't want to take the time and money to be forced to travel to a destination wedding. So when your clinical trial involves travel, to most people, it's a downer. And believe me, it isn't a destination wedding. Like that job I mentioned, you want it to be conveniently located, close to home or at home in a decentralized trial. Travel takes a lot out of people, especially those with disease. We learned in another study about telehealth that so many patients greeted at-home Zoom appointments with glee. Finally, they said all those issues of travel, just difficulties for those in wheelchairs, those who rely on someone else for transportation, those with gastro diseases like Crohn's or ulcerative colitis who want to be close to a bathroom, those with social anxiety and traveling in bad weather. Most people don't want to have to travel. I know it isn't always possible to have a decentralized trial, but try to reduce the number of trips if possible. Over three quarters chose a decentralized trial over an on-site trial when given the direct choice. And here are some of the reasons for preferring the decentralized trial. Comfort and convenience of remaining at home. Patients have children and pets who need care. See, it's not just about the patient, it's about the, the rest of their household. Patients have a job, family, and daily lives they don't want to disrupt. Travel is a hassle for some, a barrier for others. Less physical exposure to others. That especially came up, as you can imagine, during COVID. Travel is especially difficult for some patients, as I mentioned before, with, with disabilities or Crohn's disease, that type of thing. So there's a lot of reasons for, for, for preferring decentralized. Now, you saw, though, that about a quarter did prefer on-site, so let's not ignore those. Um, here were their reasons. Immediate access to healthcare professionals and equipment. More thorough examination and supervision. They prefer face-to-face -face interaction with researchers. They prefer to get out for mental well-being. They feel there's less likely for something to go wrong. And finally, they think, I may not do it right at home. So while the large majority want to decentralize, there, there's elements of on-site that are very appealing to people. So uh, if you wanted to allay their concerns, if you do have a decentralized trial, try to meet their concerns as well. Assure them that there is access to the professionals, that it will be thorough that you'll make sure everything is done correctly. It's all about reducing barriers, no matter where they might be coming from. And now our, our final point, communication. It's very appealing to an overwhelming majority, over 80% to receive information on the goals of the trial prior to beginning the trial. There are very various facets to this. Think back to the job analogy. When you are interviewing for a job or sending in your resume, what's the worst thing? When you get no response, did it go into some black hole? When people are stuck on a plane on the tarmac, they wanna know why, so tell them. Patients wanna hear the goals of the trial before they get started. Don't forget, people have a need to hear what is going on. And after the trial, they wanna hear about the results, positive or negative. Again, over 80% find this very appealing. I know when we do a survey ourselves with our panel and we're able to share the results, patients love that. They want to know what their participation resulted in. Just like at a company, employees want to know how their efforts helped the company's earnings. And don't just send them a journal publication of the study. Please write it in an eighth grade level so it's understandable to them. There are lots of aspects to communication before, during, and after the trial. So here, here's where they, again, they told us in a lot of open-ended, a 24-7 contact. 
They might, they might need help any time of the day or night. An app, can you do an app? What about contacting other people in the trial, creating a community? If possible, that would keep a lot of people engaged and prevent them from leaving the trial. Why are support groups so popular? Why do so many weight loss plans make it part of a group? If you can incorporate it, it could encourage more patients to sign up and stay enrolled. Thoughts to consider. To summarize, remember, these are patients, our caregivers. They have full lives, plus the addition of having a challenging disease. If they're to participate in a trial on top of all that, try not to turn their lives upside down. Reduce the burden. And travel can be a huge burden. Pay them for their time and travel and communicate, communicate, communicate. Remember, you're trying to attract them to a job. What is the pay? Is it convenient? What are the benefits? Don't tell them uh, that, uh, don't let them feel that they're out there on their own. So that comes to the end of what I was presenting. I'm happy to go into questions. I'm trying to, there we go. Uh, but let me make a note. Um, we collected lots of data here from the 2000 uh, respondents. We're happy to share the raw data, the de-identified data from the survey. If you want to analyze it further, um, all we ask is that you give credit to rare patient voice. We've had graduate students get data from our various conference studies, and many of them have had things published. So we're always happy to share this, make sure it's used, have people get more out of it. So please, if you're interested in doing that, just send me an email. and We'll be able to share that and uh, Hopefully we can help you pull more from these from all these results that the patients share with us. Awesome. Thank you, Wes, for an excellent presentation. Um, we received a few questions already, but we'll give the rest of you a moment to enter your questions in the Q&A box to the left of the slides. Uh, before we begin the q and I'll run through some brief announcements. First, I would like to thank IQVIA Rare Patient Voice and Catalan for sponsoring this digital week. Next, be, be sure to check out the resource list to the right of your screen where you can download featured articles. And finally, I'd like to mention that we will be discussing a lot more on the topic of patients in clinical trials this November in Barcelona at Clinical Trials Europe. Register for a free pass today at informaconnect.com slash clinical hyphen trials hyphen Europe applicable for pharmaceutical, biotech, and medical device companies, as well as government bodies, advocacy groups, nonprofits, patients, and academics only. So now back to Wes for the Q&A. Um, Wes, I'll ask um, the first question. Sure. Um, it says, will the slides be shared? Great insight. Certainly. We're happy to, happy to share these. I don't know if... Um... Brandy, do you do you folks send, send them? I'm happy to. You were happy yes, to send them. Uh, in 24 hours, you'll receive a link to of the recording of the session, so you'll be able to download, uh, have access to that. Um, the next question: uh, the panel was only from U.S. That's right. Um, we we did this study among our, our U.S. respondents, uh, somewhat for convenience, because we're analyzing it. Uh, I analyze the data and I analyze it in English. That doesn't mean it couldn't be done in the other languages. Uh, we're, we're also, our panel is quite strong in, in the big five countries in Europe, UK, Germany, France, Italy, and Spain. That's an interesting thought. It might be an interesting follow-up to do this study uh, in some other countries and compare the results across from country to country. Great, thank you, Wes. Um, the next question, um, can you give us a recommendation which recruiting, recruiting company is the best in the U.S. from your experience? Well, you know, this, uh, if you're getting it, you know, this is a lot, could be, could be seen as a loaded question because my company, mm -hmm. Rare Patient Voice, is a recruiting company of patients with rare and non-rare diseases. So we like to think we're certainly the best at recruiting patients, but that's uh, fully self-serving. So, uh, you know, take that, take that, <laughs> take that from me. So, but we're always happy to, uh, to uh, give you our feasibility. We're very honest about our feasibility. We won't want to overpromise. We actually list 
on our website. If you go to rarepatientvoice.com under uh, for researchers, we list our counts by disease, uh, by patient, by caregiver, and by country. So we're very honest about what we have and what our best guess based on the response rates and the incidence rates of your study, what we can get. We don't want to overpromise folks. So um, uh, I don't know that 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 answers your question, but it's like, thank you for asking. <laughs> Great. Uh, the next question for you, Wes, is rare patient voice just in the U.S. possible to recruit for clinical trials in other countries? Yeah, and that's just what I was referring to. So yeah, we've expanded outside okay. the U.S. in the last few years. So um, we have about 100,000 patients and caregivers in the U.S., but about 30,000 outside primarily in those big five European countries. So yes, um, um, those, those patients have signed up uh, to be invited to any kinds of research and we're happy to help recruit them for clinical trials in all those countries. Great, um, my next question for you. Reaching specific patient populations can be challenging. How does Rare Patient Voice build and provide patient panels? Oh, what we do is we go to patient events is one thing. That's what I said today. I'm at the uh, sickle cell conference and uh, we, we like to meet patients in person. Uh, one, we can explain to them what research is about. So they're more comfortable. With it. And then we see that they're real people. People don't just come into the sickle cell conference to, to fraudulently to take part in research. So it's, it's a great uh, two way uh, method of recruiting patients. We also work with uh, referral partners. We have over 4,000 referral partners. We meet them at these events too. I just met a woman that runs a sickle cell um, chapter in uh, Tennessee. And so we love to work with, with, with groups like that. Uh, so they spread the word to their folks. And, um, and then we, social media is helpful too. Uh, we have a team that, that's, that reaches out and, and invites folks to sign up that way. So there's a lot of different ways we go about it. Word of mouth is terrific. Once somebody's uh, uh, sign, signed up, like somebody I'll meet today at, at this conference, once they sign up and do a study, they're eager to share the words. Because one, we, we pay them. You know, I talk about compensation. Well, we pay folks at the rate of $120 an hour. But they spread the word. Uh, they might be in a support group. Um, they might, it might be a genetic disease, it might be family and relatives. Uh, so they spread the word and that's been a, from the very start, that's been a great way for us to, uh, to grow our patient populations. Great, thank you. Uh, this next question is about payments. Uh, do you believe that patients could use fake information just to get on the, get on the trial, likely decreasing quality of the potential participants? Well, that's, that's the issue of fraud. That's always a concern. You always want to do, um, you know, everything possible. That's an issue in market research, certainly, um, where, where folks even from around the world can uh, do an online survey and, and make it look like they're, for example, in the U.S. and, uh, and do that. There's, there's a lot of methods that are used to try to, to root that out. I say our, our, the most important method we use is how we recruit the patients. As I said, nobody's coming to this sickle cell conference off the street just to do surveys. I mean, they're, they're, they, they paid to come, they're learning, et cetera. So that, that's been a wonderful way uh, to do it, just consider the source of the patients. But there's a lot of things that, that need to be done. But the clinic trial especially, uh, they're going to be, you know, it's not just about filling in their inclusion and exclusion criteria. Obviously, they're gonna have to meet with uh, representatives of the trial and, and go through things and have medical records and things like that. So uh, I haven't run into that with clinical trials because it's at a certain point, you know, you know, they're not going to get very far. And they're not, you know, with a survey, they may get paid. So they're like, oh, if I just click all these boxes, I get paid for doing survey. They're not going to get reimbursement for a clinical trial just by filling out something online. It's going, they're going to have to get long down the line to the randomization phase. So uh, I'd be interested to hear what others think. I, I would be a little less concerned in that, in that case. It's one thing to, 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 um, to fake a disease online and click boxes. It's another thing to, to uh, meet with folks, uh, to have medical questions asked, and, and uh, share your blood and uh, to take, take uh, the medication that's in trial. So uh, I would think that would be less likely. But keep, always keep your guard up. Always, assume, you know, always say, what, what if somebody were trying to do it? How would we... How would we uh, uh, discover them, make sure that they, they, they don't uh, come through our filters. 
Excellent, thank you. Um, my next question for you is when you collected the data, did you also collect any data on social determinants of health, such as race, gender, ethnicity? If so, did you gain any insight that should be considered? Great question. We, uh, we collected uh, some demographic information, uh, which I didn't put here in the interest of time, but we, we, we have, uh, have, have some of that. Um, and it, the data could certainly be an, analyzed further for that, uh, just looking at how their answers vary by that. We looked at that uh, in general, but we haven't done a specific analysis of that. So uh, I, I, I welcome folks if they're interested in looking at this further to see what they can tease out. I wouldn't call it an in-depth study of the social determinants at all. Again, this was a fairly quick uh, survey. We didn't pay people for the results. So when we don't pay people, we want to keep it, um, you know, in a whatever, 10, 15 minute time frame. But a great, great idea. There's certainly a lot of um, more information that could be garnered uh, or in further studies about that, that whole important area. Great, thank you. Uh, next question for you, Wes. If you pay potential prospects to fill online surveys, is that frowned upon by IRB? And Wait. where does IRB, oh, go ahead. No, no, go, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Okay, <laughs> oh, where does IRB start mandating patient compensation? Uh, yeah, great question. When we do market research studies, it's very rare that there's an IRB involved. Sometimes if it's what they call health economics outcome research, uh, there could be an IRB involved, but usually if it's commercial market research, it's it's not uh, involved with IRB. Certainly IRBs are involved with clinical trials. So the key that, that I found is you need to work with them from the very beginning. You don't wanna have them having completed and authorized your study and afterwards say, oh, we wanna pay people. You need to start at the beginning and, and work with them to say, here's what we're doing and here's why we're doing it and make sure you get their, their uh, their agreement. As it frowned upon, I guess that varies by not only IRB, but by the individuals and by the specific study and the, and the reason. Certainly, uh, uh, some trials are uh, offering uh, compensation. So, um, someone in my family was just uh, being enrolled in a clinical trial, and there was compensation involved uh, on, on various levels for that. So it certainly is possible. I think the key is to start at the very beginning, make sure the uh, uh, IRB is involved, um, and about them mandating past, uh, I don't, I don't know if they were mandated. It's it's more about them approving or disapproving of the design of your study. Great, thank you, Wes. <clears throat> um, my next question for you: Rare patient voice recruits for market research surveys like this one you mentioned, correct? Um, does rare patient voice also recruit for clinical trials? Yes. Uh, so yeah, we started in market research. That was my background. And um, over the years, then clients would come to us and say, wait a minute, if you have patients with disease X, could we invite them for clinical trials? So we thought, why not? I mean, on, on the one hand, they're completely different animals. Market research, typically more people will qualify. They're not giving blood. They're just giving their opinions. Uh, whereas clinical trials, obviously there's there's a lot more to that and eventually they'd be enrolled and take a drug or a placebo, whatever it might be. But from our point of view, it's very similar. We have people identified by their condition uh, that who are very interested in, in being invited to research. So from our point of view, it's it's similar. We, we can send an email and have the appropriate invitation uh, sent to them. So we do have done that and we've been doing more of that. And we're, we, we look at it as we're offering another opportunity for the patients. If they're, they can take part in a clinical trial and, and, and help themselves or help those coming after, uh, that can only help the patient community. And what steps does uh, Rare Patient Voice take to protect data and patients' privacy? Oh, good. Yeah, that, that's, that's key. Um, the, uh, if, if data, people's health data is very sensitive information and nobody wants it out there. They, they have a right not to have anybody else see their, their, their health data. So we have to be very, very careful with that. So we do a lot of things about that. First of all, we give all our panelists an ID code. It's a long string of letters and numbers. That's what we share with our clients. So they don't know that it's John Smith from 
uh, Topeka or something. They know the, 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 the ID code that the person has. And, um, and we know who they are, so we can send them the payment. So when somebody does, for example, a market research study, we know who they are and their address, and we pay them, but we don't see their answers to the questions. We don't see their interviews. The client sees their answers, but doesn't get their, their, their personal identification information. So that, that's one way that's, that protects them. There's certainly a lot of things that we have to do with our systems to protect information. We, uh, we're proud that we just recently got certified for the second year. Uh, there's something called ISO 27001. Some of you may know about it. A lot of, um, uh, of hurdles to, to go through, no, well, I hope not to go through, go over, to get that certification about how, how data is stored, how your company is run, how everything is, is processed to make sure that you're, we're, and in this case, we're taking every step possible not to uh, put at risk um, people's data. Something as simple as we, we don't send any of that information via email. We use a HIPAA compliant uh, share file portal. S simple things like that to make sure the data is not out there where some bad actor could get a hold of it. I always say, if we if we had our uh, that data out, we'd be out of business. Patients wouldn't trust us, clients wouldn't trust us. So we have to be very, very vigilant in that area. Great, thank you, Wes. Uh, my next question for you. Does Rare Patient Voice recruit family caregivers as well as patients for studies? Oh yeah, and we did in this, in this um, survey that we did, uh, we had 10% of the respondents were caregivers. So, so often caregivers are, are key because uh, there's a lot of childhood diseases. We, for example, we don't um, interview, uh, certainly not without the parents' permission, but we don't go out directly to anyone under 16. Uh, so in that case, you're talking typically to the parent, a caregiver. Um, uh, some diseases, people are so disabled, they might have um, uh, a late, late stage of ALS or something. So you, we, we need to talk with their caregiver. Or think of the dementia patients, the Alzheimer's patients. We're typically talking to either a spouse or an adult, adult child. So we need to do that. Um, and it's interesting because a lot of people will sign up with us. They're a patient and a caregiver. They might be a caregiver of a kid with disease X or a spouse with disease Y, and then they have disease Z themselves. So people have a lot of different roles. They're not just a patient or a caregiver. They may, they may be both at the same time. Great, thank you. Uh, my next question is, um, what percentage of patients are recruited from certain EHRs and what percentage of patients are recruited from social media sites? Well, we don't search uh, EHRs, electronic health records. We're not recruiting from that. Um, again, we, we go to the patient events, we work with referral partners, um, and we're not recruiting them from social media sites. We do go out on social media, and well, it depends what you mean. So we'll use Facebook and such, or typically our referral partner, which more, much more successful is our referral partner, we'll put it on their Facebook page. And usually it's a closed Facebook page, just to the people in their group with their, with their condition. And um, they'll do it. In terms of percentages, I couldn't say. When we first started, the overwhelming percentage were in person, as you can imagine, because that's what we did. We went to the groups. Then people started sharing the words. Then we got referral partners into it. As I say, we have now over 4,000 referral partners. So that percentage, and then COVID hit, and the in-person events went away. So now they're back, but, but um, not to the full extent that they were 2017, 18, 19, when we, we, we go to over 350 events in a year. So um, I wouldn't want to put a number on it, but uh, it's, it's, it's you know, split between those various methods. OK, thank you. Um, here's another question about patient-friendly communication. Um, where would you suggest to start to be really relevant in the communication? Um, hmm, uh, Start like well, it could, that could a couple different ways to interpret that. Start in terms of the timeline of a trial, or start in terms of how how to do it. I'm uh, proud to be a member, though I'm not the, the other people do much more work than I do. Of a group in this Intellis Worldwide, Intellis is a uh, group of healthcare market research folks, and we have a group called the Clear Communications um, Group. It's got a better name than that. But we work on health literacy because it's so important not to communicate uh, 
in, in terms people don't understand. Just when they're going to the physician, what they hear, what they understand, and the materials that companies provide, et cetera, et cetera. So one area to start from that point of view is, in, in, from a health literacy point of view, there's some wonderful materials, there's guidelines, and TELUS has some materials that we share uh, to, to please use, use language that's very, very understandable to people. So that that's a key that's a key part of the communication. In terms of the timeline, I am not I don't pretend to be a clinical. We don't actually conduct clinical clinical trials. I, I want to make that clear. We invite our patients, and then if they're if they pass muster, uh, our clients handle the clinical trial. So I don't want to I'll put myself in as a clinical trial expert. But um, what I would say though is the the earlier the communication, the better. Uh, asking patients, talking with patients. I know a lot of companies, um, when they design a clinical trial, it's good to talk to patients, talk to a group of patients. You can talk to a, 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 an advocacy group. We often will recruit patients for a, a small group settings or for, for individual interviews to, for, for clinical trial designers to talk with because they might learn some key things about how they might design it to make it more attractive to the patients. So it's, it's never too early. And you'll, you'll hear this. We go to the, so many rare disease conferences and such. And, the advocates from all the groups say, it's never too early to start talking. Please don't do everything and then just come to the patients at the end for their stamp of approval. One, you're gonna miss things, and two, they, that, doesn't, that doesn't feel very good to them. That doesn't feel like you're really caring about their opinion. So um, ask early and, and talk clearly, if I had to boil it down to two things. Great, thank you, Wes. Um, it looks like that's all the questions um, we have for today. So if anyone submitted a question, obviously that wasn't answered. Um, keep in mind that the speaker will reach out to you directly. Um, the session was recorded. You'll receive a notification in 24 hours when the on-demand session is available for viewing. Um, also, please take a moment to complete the feedback form so we can continue to improve your digital week experience. And thank you again, Wes, for a great session. Well, thanks, and thanks for all the uh, thoughtful questions. I appreciate it. Thank you. And on behalf of Informer Connect Life Sciences, have a great day. Bye-bye. Okay,